listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast brought to you by DraftKings. Um, great deal going on right now. You throw down $5 on an NFL game during Wild Card Weekend. If that team wins, you get $280. 56 to 1 odds there, my friends. Make it happen right there. All right, with John Schuster, I'm Mike Luke. William Brad Alice will be joining us shortly. Uh, Sean C. We already got comments coming in. Sean Seeley says, I won't make it to the post game. Let's go Wildcats with the blowout. Have a great show. Sean, as always, you're greatly appreciated. All right. Arizona wins 76 to 55. This was a game where Colorado was game for a little while, you know, it looked like it was going to get out of hand really early. And Colorado was able to get it from about 16 points to about, uh, you know, I think four at one point. And then Arizona just by attrition broke them down in the second half. But you know what? I thought it was a I thought it was a spirited performance by the Buffalo, even though they don't have nearly the talent Arizona does. And it was pretty clear fairly early on that they didn't. But uh, they're one of the pesky teams in this conference, and I think they're going to be difficult for a lot of teams to deal with. And and they're in a position where even though there's a talent deficiency against the top tier in this league. They play generally pretty fundamentally well, and it gives them, especially on defense, and that gives them an opportunity to be in games. If the other team is struggling offensively, that helps as well, and Colorado can get an upset here and there. Hey, three and one coming into this matchup in conference play, now uh, falling to three and two. Arizona was in control, pulled away over the course of the last eight minutes and really over the juncture of the second half. Uh, and e even there, Mike, to be honest, Arizona, what? controlled 35 minutes of this game, 35, right. 32 minutes yeah. of this game. And uh, there was one run that Colorado had uh, late in the first half that made it a lot closer than it ultimately was. Cats always in control, uh, but, you know, showed that they're, Colorado is one of the teams in this league that I think is uh, going to be pesky. And, Mike, you and uh, you, Anthony Jamino and I did a show, uh, I don't Tony. know, six, six weeks ago where Anthony and I got in a little bit of a debate in regards to what we thought, how this conference was at that stage. And I thought it was a very top heavy league and the teams at the top are still at the top. Those were Arizona, UCLA, USC in no particular order. And then I felt like there were a lot of dregs below that. Anthony had a slightly different opinion of that. And I think his opinion is bearing out a little bit more. Clearly, Oregon, and this should just absolutely shock everybody, given the track record uh, with Dana Altman and Eugene, uh, the Ducks look like they are getting close to being legit and being a real problem in this conference. And perhaps if they can advance into the NCAA tournament uh, as well, once the uh, once the weeks progress here, uh, that should shock absolutely no one. They want to add an empty poly pavilion tonight mm -hmm. get uh, used to saying UCLA. empty poly pavilion by the way yeah i'm hoping uh, and i think a lot of wildcat fans are hoping that will change by uh the the scheduled january 25th game with arizona at ucla but you know who the heck knows it's in effect until january 21st and obviously we'll see but anyway i think you're looking at oregon state whose overall record isn't very good but there's some talent on that roster. I think they're going to get better. Stanford's uh, Stanford's a team I'd throw into the pesky category. Washington State's another team in that group. So it helps in overall depth. And Arizona saw a team that is not as good physically as they are, but a team that's going to play hard and challenge you a little bit. And Colorado did that until the Cats pulled away. You know what? Somebody that's always in a peak performance joining the stream, oh, William yeah. Brad Alice. Hello, William. I am now in the presence of greatness. You yeah. are in the presence of well, greatness. You're in the presence of greatness all the time because you're constantly in the presence of Brad Alice. William, what'd you think? What what'd you think of what what you saw out there? We just broke it down, just kind of uh, initially initial thoughts from Mister uh, Mister William Brad Alice. You know, it was one of those games where Arizona looked like they hadn't played in ten days. They got out, you know, a little slow. Then they got out to that big lead, let them come back, and then really blew their doors off in, in the second half. So they looked like a team that was yeah a little rusty at times, was physically superior to a Colorado team who's 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 fine, who's good. Um, you know, as you said on Twitter, we we're having fun with it. They don't suck, right. but they're not that good either. They're not, you know, they're not a tournament team, but they're, you know, they're going to finish what fifth, sixth, seventh in the conference. And that's probably where they deserve to be. I think what's exciting about this Arizona team, though, you look at it 
And we've talked a lot about, you know, Benedict Matherin and Julius Tabellis and all those guys. But you got 25 points off the, or 26 points off the bench today. And, you know, Pella Larson's been kind of a lightning rod this so far this season. I haven't thought he, to me, he hasn't been very good. But this was the kind of game that I think that kind of shows you, you know, what, what he can do. Make your open shots. Don't turn the ball over. Have a couple nifty finishes around the hoop. Justin Kyer, much the same way. Although I think Kyer's got a little bit higher of a plateau that he can reach. But what did you guys think about just watching those two guys out there giving, you know, 25 points when you cert certainly haven't been used to that so far? Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, Kyer's a guy who does impress me at times. I think he, you know, he's a guy who's not going to do it every game. But when he comes out and he he kind of takes control of games, he's able to do that. He you know he can get you that eight to ten, twelve points when you need him. Larson, you know, yeah, I agree with you. He hasn't been impressive, but we don't know what the foot's like. We don't know how much that really took out of him. Now we'll know as he progresses through the second half of the season, which is really going to be what the second two thirds of the season. I think right. we'll get a much better idea what kind of athlete, what kind of player Pella Larson is. But, you know, a lot of people, I think, overhyped him coming in. This was a guy who, what, averaged eight points for a pretty mediocre to bad Utah team. So I'm not expecting him to come in and be a 14-point-a-game guy. But he needs to be a glue guy. He, Kyer, um, you know, Balo, that's the reason they come off the bench. They're, they're guys to give you um, just some depth and some 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 role playing, and if they can have a game where they step up as as they did, and especially Kyer tonight, all the better. But they're not supposed to lead the way, and I don't think you know they're really capable night in and night out of leading the way. Yeah, but that's what I'm fine with that. And uh, Robbie Dewitt, a longtime listener, always appreciates your contributions. Um, she just set anybody else up. Well, according to this and on Twitter, we've got 49 people that are still up here in Tucson. So you know what? Uh, we'll we'll, we'll take it right now. Um, but uh, I think Brad just hit the nail on the head right there. I don't with bench players. I don't unless you're Jason Terry or somebody of that ilk, I don't necessarily expect a, you know, said performance from you. I just need to know that you're somewhat capable of it. And this was a game that I think at least kind of showed me that, all right, you do have a little bit of firepower coming off the bench there, Shu. And I am a big, I'm a big fan of Kyer. There's games where he doesn't do, I think, probably what he should from a statistical standpoint. But doesn't he have the feeling to a certain extent that, there's going to be a game where he's going or there's going to be games in the tournament where Arizona's not relying on him, but he's going to be a big factor in that of, of getting a game that maybe Arizona's going to really need him from shoe. It very well could be. And one of the things that uh, sometimes bench players provide other than depth in a specific position is a little bit of a specific identity. And Kyer looks like he's the most potentially advanced at this. He does something that a lot of the rest of the roster doesn't. Seems to be a little bit more physical and sometimes on the defensive end. That's something that I think can be very helpful uh, to Arizona. But um, yeah, there were some really interesting lineups tonight. Lloyd was willing to go to the bench, give the uh, give give those guys a lot of extra playing time. Larson played well, although I think they – you know, there there still seems to be a speed issue and maybe a functionality issue that he's still trying to work his way into it. It still seems to be like a, you know, it's, it may not be all the way there yet. Maybe Brad's right. This is just what he is. Uh, but I'm hopeful there continues to be just some sort of a little bit more fluid improvement, although his numbers were very good tonight, and that's nice to see. Kyer had good numbers tonight. That's nice to see. And Ballo provides a definite presence on the inside. So allowing your roster to have the ability to utilize a variety of different lineups, I think goes a long way toward helping what you want to accomplish once you get closer to the tournament. William? You know, I think something to think about is, you know, what are, one of my criticisms of the later era Miller teams is they weren't particularly well constructed. Um, it looked like he was pulling, you know, like Alfred did at UCLA. Yeah, I can stockpile, but I don't have the necessarily the right guys. I think this right. team, even though some of it's by default, is better constructed. Um, you know, you don't have a controversy with, you know, last year, was like, who was the big guy? Well, was it Jordan? Was, wait, was Jordan the sixth man? Here, they've got two elite bigs. Then they've got Balo, who who just is a, a bull in the china shop, but is not on the level of the other guys. 
you know, when healthy, they'd have an Aiken. But Kyer was brought in to be kind of this guy who won, you know, he's a, what, 24, 23-year-old grown man. Mm-hmm. Uh, oftentimes playing against a bunch of 18 and 19 years old. You know, he's on his what? What, 107th school. But it's well constructed. Larson has a role. Kyer has a role. Now, Kyer's a little more adaptable, I think, if he can give you a little more scoring punch. But this team was constructed to be an you know an eight and a half man rotation, and if they ever get Aiken back, then they'll have that. If not, they have the traditional Lute Olson eight man rotation, and, it, and it's uh, well constructed, I think. I it's would not say yeah, would a say- bad thing either, Mike. Um, in that uh, you know eight eight should be enough depth. And yes. if you can plug in a guy, you know, two guys in the backcourt, one guy in the front court, it gives you an opportunity I, to do what you need to do. The Cats are the team so far this year, and tonight was another example of that. They're the team that have been effective in generally wearing down the opposition. And, uh, you, you know, that kind of depth, I think, is helpful. Yeah, all right. So uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint U of A, I think I'm saying that right, said, do you have an update on Aiken? I do have an update on Aiken, but not the update that some people might be thinking about. But – I also want, I want to get a little bit into the transfer issue, too, that uh, you guys were just talking about there with Jordan Brown in a second. But I do want to tell you about the DraftKings Sportsbook app first. Code word PHNX. William, I'm going to incorporate your team in here. Listen to this. If you're a new customer to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, you throw down $5 on any of the wild card games this week, and if that team wins, you get – $280 in free plays, 56 to one odds. Schuster and I have been talking about this throughout the week. Here's what you do. Oh, and again, here's the disclaimer. Arizona only, 21 and up. If you got a gambling problem, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. They'll get you all taken care of. Get you right back out, back out on feet, doing everything that you need to do. All right, William, here is the DraftKings Sportsbook app pick of the week. The Kansas City Chiefs over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Are we talking money line? Or are we talking? Oh, uh, we're talking spread? money line straight yeah. up, my friend. Yeah, Chiefs are terrible against the spread. Really good against the money line. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's uh, fairly. Although there's that romantic notion of of Ben with his last run, but um, he just no, he don't look good. It's not happening. And Looks the like Chiefs John beat him by twenty five without Tyree Kill and, and and Kelsey. So yeah. I, I don't bet on my own teams. But you would uh, here. But, uh, yeah, if you haven't taken advantage of that little code because, you know, you haven't downloaded the app yet, uh, this might not be a bad one to do. All right. Here's what I'm going to break some news right here. Uh, Okay. He says it's S-T-U. Stu of A. Uh, Stu of A. Duh. My bad. Now, he's he's good enough to be a saint, but he's Stu of A. I do like Saint U of A, though. (laughs) All right. I saw Kim Aiken today. Kim Aiken was working out at Vasa Fitness on the stair stepper. That's all I got. So, um, you know what? There's your Kim Aiken update for you. I kid you not. Is that worrisome that he's not at the rec center or the facility? I don't think it's a good thing, but you know what? I'm going to leave it alone. I said hi to Kim. He doesn't know who I am. He was very nice. He said hello to me back. And you know what? I walked out of there feeling accomplished. Now, so. no disrespect to Kim Aiken, but are you sure it's not one of those 40-year-old guys who plays pickup ball? Because Kim Aiken looks like a 40-year-old guy who plays pickup ball. I am 100% sure okay. because I said, I said, Kim, we need you out there. And he looked at me and he just said soon. So Okay, there, there we go. There we go. There's your, there's your hard-hitting uh, gumshoe sleuth. And that. Is it gumshoe? Gumshoe, right? Well, that's that's shoes, Uncle. Yes, gumshoe. All right. <laughs> you know something, guys, and this is a little bit off topic that's actually kind of interesting, though. Arizona has a smorgasbord of transfers across the country who are playing incredibly good basketball right now. Alex Barcelo putting up 19 a game at BYU. Jordan Brown putting up 15 a game at what Louisiana Lafayette. Terrell Brown Jr., putting up over 20 a game at Washington right now. James Akinjo starting at point guard for the number one team in the country. Generally, when guys leave Arizona, they leave here to wilt away and die. This is a, this is a, uh, this is a situation right here. That's a very unusual. Well, the predecessor could recruit. That's for sure. Right. For sure. How, how exactly some of that recruiting happened is uh, up in the air, but uh, obviously there was some uh, talent in the pipeline and, Maybe to some degree, they've just found more comfort 
elsewhere. And uh, good for them. It has definitely been a, a, an interesting string for former Wildcats. And, and, and it's been good fortune for the current roster mm-hmm. of Wildcats as well. So that's, you know, I guess a win-win for everybody involved. And I'm glad to see that uh, in one way or another, there's a little uh, spreading of the wealth out there that you can have players who used to be in the program doing a good job and still have a good program, borderline really good program, headed perhaps this year into great program territory that can still function very well. All of the, none of those guys, well, actually, the only one that doesn't surprise me a little bit by his success was Akinjo, just because Akinjo was good. But, William, were you surprised by the success that some of these guys are having? You know, Brown doesn't surprise me either because of level of competition, and I like Brown better than a lot of people. But I think the guy who surprises me and has for now three years is Barcelo because he, I just don't know what the deal was at Arizona. Maybe at the end of the day, it was just Sean Miller was too mean for him. I know there was, Rumors of some some you know stuff with his his personal life, but uh, he's been outstanding for a BYU team right. who plays a pretty good schedule. So good for him because I really liked him coming out of high school. I thought he was a kind of a poor man's uh, who was the point guard for Stanford years ago, Chris uh, Hernandez. Chris Hernandez, yeah. So I thought he was kind of a poor man's Hernandez, uh, and and kind of is now for BYU. Um, Brown surprises me. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you didn't mention the guy who has failed uh, to live up to any hype, uh, Dutrieve, who got dismissed from Boise State, unfortunately. Oh, but I forgot Those about demons. it. Demons. ACOT's playing well, though. ACOT playing well. I forgot about that one right there. So there you go. I mean, there you go, and there you have it right there. So generally, you don't see guys go off to have the kind of success they've had. So one guy, though, that I did find interesting in this game is – um, Shu, I know you don't really follow recruiting. I know that that's really since you got out of the traditional media, that's something that I know you miss. Um, oh, you know, go, immensely. Yes, you know, going immensely. to all, going to those going to those mm-hmm. games and watching kids. But William Love knows it. about this. KJ Simpson was a kid that was committed to the U of A under uh, Sean Miller. That was the probably the best player on the court there for Colorado. I was watching that game, saying, you know what. That's the one guy that I wish that Arizona could still have right now, and that was K.J. Simpson there. What would you think about him, Brad? Yeah, you know, he played pretty well. Uh, I wasn't sure what kind of role he'd have on this team this year, but I think if you look at it in hindsight, he'd probably take a lot of Pella Larson's minutes. Not mm-hmm. quite the same player. I think he's a little bit better of a scorer, obviously. not, But uh, certainly, again, he had his best. Of course, going against Arizona, he has his best game because the guy always has his best game. Uh, when he comes to McHale. But, uh, yeah, he's a good, solid player, does some good things. And I think, yeah, I think he would be a rotational guy uh, for this team. I know Stu of A wants to know which transfers would be starters on this team. I really think there's probably, as good as all these guys are playing, probably the only guy who starts on this team. And I don't know if he fits on this team, but talent-wise, it's a Kenjo. But I'm not sure he necessarily – I don't know if he'd adapt to it because he really likes kind of dominating the ball. But uh, from a talent wise, I think he he might be, uh, you know, a little more athletic, a little better passer than than Kreisa, But Kreisa certainly just has found a niche on this team. He he really has. And Schuster and I have talked about this quite a bit. You know, the the guy gets beaten up a lot, but you know, I, I am more than okay with Kirk Kreisa as my point guard, just because I feel comfortable with him in big spots with big moments. Um, all right. Now let's talk about something that I think is I think is a fascinating topic here. Ricky Garrett, right here, by the man, good follow on Twitter. He said, "What's with Coloco? Why is he regressed so much? He's not aggressing aggressive, and he's turning it over way more. Lost some confidence." In my opinion, then I'm going to let the two experts go right there. I think this is a situation where he wasn't. He's definitely better than he's been, a lot better. But he also wasn't as good as he showed earlier in the season. And I think when you go against better teams, you still see some of his shortcomings come into play. The game's a little too fast, a little too physical. And so, again, he's good, but he's not that first-team All-American good that we were thinking. William then Shu, what do you got? I think it comes down to level of competition. If you look at what he did against Tennessee, Illinois, and even Wyoming, who had a really good big guy, he scored 14 total points. Mm-hmm. Um, in almost all the other games, going up against undersized guys, not athletic guys, you know, he averages upwards of 20. So I think that's what it really comes down to. I think when you play, um, you know, it, it, Illinois' big guy, uh, Coburn, when you're playing the the pretty really dynamic big guy for Wyoming, 
uh, Tennessee's going to throw athletes at you. That half second you took to think about it, that half second where I'm bigger than everyone, so I can kind of go up and decide why I'm going up. You don't have that. Um, right. you know, he gave up also a lot of weight. You know, Coburn's what three ten. Mm-hmm. Um, the the big guy for uh, who he actually outplayed in many respects, but the big guy for Wyoming is a big, physical, grown man. Um, so those are the guys I think. Again, we I think I think we all knew this that he'd have trouble with. What I don't think we knew is how good Coloco would be in these games where he is the better athlete and he is the bigger guy, right. and he's been much better than I think he's he's kind of was everything we'd hoped. But I don't think any of us believe. But again, I think it's a matchup thing. And, uh, you know, tonight, you know, Colorado threw some some older, bigger bodies at him. Not necessarily elite talent. Um, but I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing now as the competition ramps up and you're not playing some of these smaller schools, uh, he's going to struggle more often than, than he did in the preseason. Schuster you, Schuster, you are ahead of the curve. You're for being ahead of the curve and flattening the curve at the same time. What did you uh, – what if what, what's kind of just we're halfway through the season right now we know what christian coloco is good and do bad we? oh maybe maybe i think we kind of do all right it's your it's your turn go sorry well, what, what do you think he is i think he's a very very good defensive big man who's going to be able to cause a lot of problems uh for anybody in the nation down low blocking shots because of well like we saw against kofi coburn same situation, you know, Coburn, I think, had his worst game of the season, 5 of 15. Um, offensively, he can do he, – he can finish, but if you're going against a really big team or you're going against teams that got some physical players, I think he's going to have an issue right there. But I do think that Arizona is able to kind of buoy that a little bit by having guys like Azulis Tabellis, Ben Matherin, getting into the lane that's able to kind of – you know, make up for some of those shortcomings. But I don't think he's ever going to be the guy that we saw in the first, you know, seven, eight games of the season where it's like, oh, gosh, is this guy going to be averaging 18 a game? I don't think that's ever going to be in the cards. At this stage, I and, and maybe, maybe through the entirety of his career here, I'm far less interested in how many points uh, Christian Coloco can score. Is it the Lauren Woods what, thing for you? I, I, I want to know what he can do on the defensive end, and I want, I want to know what he can do uh, from, from a disruption standpoint and what he can do in terms of getting block shots and rebounds. That's all defense. Uh, what I don't want to see him doing on the offensive end is uh, being a guy who causes turnovers. If, <laughs> right. if, if you're going to throw him the ball, he can't have the hand issue that we've seen pop up from time to time, and then you've got a wasted possession because you tried to push it on the inside. Arizona tonight – had an obvious height advantage. It was pretty clear that their strategy was go on the inside and try to take advantage of that. And at times with Tabellus, it worked really well. Uh, and, and they went with, you know, Arizona went with Ballo quite a bit tonight too, uh, trying to make something like that work. But, you know, there were times when they'd go inside to Coloco and it would kind of be a wasted possession. And mm-hmm. that's, I think, the thing that you want to avoid. If you push it on the inside, then Coloco has to be able to hold on to the ball favorably, and if he doesn't have a good look, kick it out to somebody else and see, see what Arizona can do in the half court and move it around again. Uh, those, are the, those are the issues that are, in, that are in front of him. But he's far more important on the inside defensively, and it allows Arizona to do so many different things potentially, uh, potential beneficial things when he's on the floor. And tonight was a great example of that. Remember, we talk a lot about, you know, Arizona didn't score its average tonight and Colorado was pesky and the rest of it. Colorado scored, shot, what, 29% in the first half in this game? Right. And right. it couldn't have been a whole heck of a lot better right. in the second half. They finished with 55 points. Right. That means that Arizona defensively was, again, really good. And Coloco is largely instrumental. There are other guys. Terry clearly is important in this dynamic. But, but Coloco is so critical – to Arizona's effectiveness on the defensive end, and that's where he really needs to excel. All right, I got to get this one read in here, and then uh, we're we're going to get on to another topic here and where Arizona matches up in the conference. But first and foremost, this is uh, it's time to uh, let's see here, it's time to for your uh, to get your COVID shot. If you haven't gotten your COVID shot, take your shot. Uh, COVID nineteen uh, vaccines are free for everyone five and older. Those 12 and older are also now eligible for a booster. Visit az.gov 
for a location near you. If you can get, if you can get one, you know what, go ahead and get it. It's safe. It's effective. And you know what, uh, help, uh, you know, uh, help keep people safe out there. All right. UCLA loses to Oregon. Watching this game, I don't take a ton away from the the loss other than the fact that I see why UCLA probably wasn't too keen on playing Arizona coming off a, you know, what was it, a, a two-week layoff or whatever. But that's going to be a fascinating game when those two teams get to uh, uh, play each other because UCLA is very good. But UCLA also isn't necessarily nearly as long or athletic as Arizona. Sure, they've got they're better on the perimeter outside of Ben Mather, and I don't think there's any question about that. But these two teams have strengths that the other one doesn't. There, Brad, and I think it's going to be a fascinating thing to follow. Yeah, and I think each provides, like you said, a matchup challenge for the other. Um, Arizona's athleticism, UCLA is still, even despite the result tonight, really good team. In fact. I was impressed. I didn't watch much of it, but I watched them basically erase that four point lead with about 30 seconds left uh, to force overtime. And, uh, you know, I think again, maybe that's a different game if, if they're whatever five fans who actually cheer were there. But um, yeah, I think again, and you throw USC into the mix. I don't think USC is quite as good as Arizona and UCLA, but they're uh, again, very talented, very athletic. and, And they're, I think, with their athleticism, they can they can go on runs like Arizona does. So I think those obviously we've talked about those are the three best teams in the league, and look really look forward to seeing them play, and we really look forward to seeing them play be, just because kind of want to see what Arizona really looks like after this layoff. And as Arizona is the layoff going to end up long term being good for them as they got right. to work on things, work out some kinks, or is it something where they were riding a wave of momentum and maybe now? You know, teams prepare, they they come back down to earth. So I think we're going to learn a lot about the top of the league. Obviously, we know who the three teams are, but I think there's a lot of basketball to play, and that pecking order is going to uh, kind of start sorting itself out, and we'll figure out really who is king of the Pac-12. Dylan Kaiser, I think, hits the nail on the head right here where he said, it felt like tonight uh, showed that Matherin's our best player, but there's something different about this team when Tabellus gets going. Tabellus, so we were doing our season grades, and Tabellus got a B from me, but Tabellus, I still feel, is leaving stuff on the table. I when, when I watch this team, that's the one guy that I look at and I say, okay, you know, you're getting, you know, 14 and 8, whatever, you know, whatever the numbers are, but Tabellus feels like he should be a consistent double double but a legitimate double double not always just kind of lurking around 12 and 7 or whatever i feel that tabella should be able to get me a solid 17 and 10 almost every single night and that just really hasn't happened to that extent yet shu and uh yeah and hope ho- hopefully you start moving generally in that direction where uh he can be a lot more consistent in the way that you're uh, ultimately looking for and uh, and i think a lot of wildcat fans are ultimately looking for as well and we'll see you know, if that's something that can take hold, because if it does, it gives Arizona another consistent weapon. And one of the things that I think is great about the Mather and Creasa combination right now is the um and and the kid from Colorado uh, tonight kind of reversed roles uh, on mm-hmm. on what we've seen from Arizona. Right. We've seen a we, we've seen some games with Arizona here where Matherin scores a bunch of points and keeps the Wildcats in the game, and then other guys are able to pick up the slack, and Arizona has an opportunity to be effective. Uh, tonight, Colorado did that with one guy who dominated for them on the offensive end and kept them in the game. They didn't have the complementary players to stay around and make it effective in the second half, but Matherin is that guy. Now, if Tabellus can also be that guy, that's additionally great. And then you, you, you've you got some positive offensive trickle down there. The guy like Creasa, who can clearly score and doesn't mind taking shots uh, in big situations. So hopefully Tabellus is a guy who can be crafty again on a consistent basis and make things work uh, for Arizona and give them the inside threat that we ultimately hope for. I sort of maybe see things a little bit differently than Brad does here in terms of the way that the Pac-12 pecking order is concerned. I look very much forward to the UCLA-Arizona game. I think both teams aren't even going to pretend. They are going to play exactly the same. They're both going to play to their strengths, and it's going to it could be 110 to 100. 
it is just going to be – Arizona thinks it can run. It'll run. UCLA thinks it can run. UCLA is going to run. And there's going to be a lot of track meet going on in a basketball game, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. UCLA also, and we saw it again tonight, UCLA is the college basketball version of the cockroach. You cannot kill them. They are the <laughs> most resilient team in the country. It, they are never out of it, almost never. Gonzaga blew their doors off. Okay, so the cockroach got stepped on once. But generally speaking, man. Keep going, guys. I got to let the dog outside. No, I just dealt with that myself. <laughs> their ability to compete until the end and stay in games is an absolutely remarkable uh, testament to what's going on there. So they are going to be, they're going to be a factor until this is all said and done. Then you have two other teams that I think are very interesting and actually more problematic potentially for Arizona than UCLA will be. That doesn't mean that UCLA isn't going to beat Arizona. It's not saying that, but their respective styles, I think it's not going to be the type of thing where one tries to impose its will on the other. It's almost like they're both going to let them play because they both think they're playing to each other's strengths. USC and Oregon are different. USC, I think, can be a real problem for Arizona uh, because of their length, because of their ability. You think you, don't you think USC is a bigger problem for Arizona than UCLA? Yes, I believe it is. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think their length and defensive ability uh, and general athleticism is, some, is so, something that could provide a lot of discomfort. Uh, for the U of A. I think that has the potential to be a lot uglier game. I'm interested to see, obviously, how it turns out. But I think that's going to be a definite challenge. And right now, do you really – yeah, I know their overall record is 10-6. and six, But do you want any part of Oregon in mid-February and heading into March? You know what's uh, going to be fascinating is if they beat – if they come out of this LA trip and they beat USC on Saturday, then all of a sudden it's a team that you're left for dead and they just beat the two best or two of the top five teams in the nation on the road. So that's going to be a fascinating one to follow. Um, what do you guys think about Barrett Hartman's question? He said, because the crowd, let's, I'll be honest with you, I've been to quite a few games and um, the crowd just hasn't generally, the crowd hasn't been what you generally expect from McHale. Now, again, there's a lot of, uh, you know, peripheral factors there. But is McHale going to be rocking when UCLA gets to town on a Thursday night? What do you guys think? I think I, mean, yes. I, I would. Yeah, I would assume so. I would assume once class, what classes got started, what yesterday, today, I think yeah. today, the, the, the student section, which apparently was very good tonight, will be even better. I think, you know, one, you've, you've got this, well, who is this Lloyd guy thing? You've got the COVID specter. Um, I also think you've got a lot of people just kind of wondering, getting confused when these, some of these games are going to be played. Um, you know, so I think, yeah, I think if they can settle into a groove and you, you're not wondering if this game is going to be canceled at the last minute, even though they're really not at the last minute, that's, I think, a perception that's out there. But I would anticipate that as the season continues, the crowds will get better and better, especially if Arizona continues to do what they've been doing. And if there are some marquee basketball games out there, and UCLA certainly falls under this category, not just from a traditional rivalry standpoint, but uh, uh, given their success last year, their current ranking, and that they're going to be uh, a top flight team in this conference and in the country throughout the course of the year, that's going to be a marquee basketball game. And I think McHale's going to turn out and McHale's going to be nuts. And uh, it will be, hopefully it's a springboard for what we've come to expect from McHale over the years. But again, I, I think Brad touched on it. Mike, you did as well. There's a lot of, it's just, it's just uneven right now. There's so much right. inconsistency, not just in this conference, but across the spectrum of college basketball. So it's so it's kind of hard to get a gauge on some stuff. I will say tonight's McHale crowd was a hell of a lot better than tonight's Poly Pavilion crowd. So <laughs> That's I'll, for I'll, sure. I'll, That's I'll for take sure. that at any stretch, you know, along the way. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll we'll go with that. But I think. You know, if you look at the if you look at the status of this conference now, generally speaking, if any of us are undervaluing Oregon by now, we're just stupid. That's just dumb. I don't you, you know, at, at some point, maybe Altman isn't going to be a wizard and take a complete hodgepodge team that doesn't look, you, you know, that loses from, you know, to some directional school in the Bahamas in late November. And then, and, and then we actually think that that's going to be how Oregon is going to be all year. Maybe one of these years, Oregon will be that. But the Oregon that I saw tonight, even though they're still, they play, wildly, they do a lot of dumb things, wildly yes. inconsistent. But they look, the athleticism is going to drive other teams crazy. 
and they're going to be a problem for Arizona as well. They may be as athletic as Arizona is, if not more, at four positions on the floor. You know, you know what? So, 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 so I think there's going to be, you, you know, undervaluing Oregon just because of their overall record is just stupidity that we shouldn't be buying into at this stage. Crete in the house. Crete in the um, house. Also, win for Altman, by the way. Tonight. Yes, by the way. DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. I got another thing that you should probably hit on here. You throw down $5 on an NFL game this wild card weekend. You get $280 in free plays if your team wins. You know what? We were just talking about Will, William is a, a big Kansas City fan. Chiefs, Royals, you know what? He's rocking it right there. I got another one for you, though. If you just say, you know what? I don't want to pick, I don't want to pick the team that William is picking. Why would I do that? I got another bet for you then. Because you're going to win, probably. That's why you do that. But yeah, what's your but bet? You know what? Maybe what's your it's pick, Mike. Maybe it's personal. Maybe you're saying, you know what? I don't want to go with the flow. I don't want to go with what those three idiots are saying. So I'm going to give you another one to pick. Not I'm bad thought there, Mike. <laughs> right, for sure. Tampa Bay Bucks. I like them over the Philadelphia Eagles this week. Um, so there, you can either take the Kansas City Chiefs, but you know what? If you don't want to pick on Williams' team, Go with the Tampa Bay Bucks. I think that they are. I think both of those are wise decisions. What say you, William? Than you, Shu? Okay. Those are my. I, that's my DraftKings pick of the week, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I would, I would take the Bucks, but I will say this: I think the Bucks. There's more, I think, pathways to upset, uh, for for the Bucks only because they're still trying to figure out their offense with all the injuries, and Philadelphia can run the ball. So if Philadelphia can establish the run uh, against uh, the the Buccaneers, I think they have a chance to make that interesting. But then again, let's go back to a, a very safe rule. Don't bet against Tom Brady in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, so while I think there are, uh, you know, there's maybe three pathways for a Philly win and two for a Pittsburgh win. Those, yeah, those two on paper look like uh, the safest bets because if you look at the other games, you know. Well, I think Dallas could certainly lose that game. San Francisco finds ways to lose football games. You're next. You got a lot of in. That that Cardinals, that Cardinals Rams game could go a hundred different ways. Um, yeah, there's you know, I think the Bengals Raiders could be one of the best games of the of, of right. a long time, especially the way the both of those teams have played recently. So yeah, I think if you're looking for the safe bid, bid uh, it's those two two seeds uh, who are hosting games. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of fun ones out there. So if you have a, a, yeah. a little bit of a, an adventurous streak, play a lot of them. Okay, here's what, if I may suggest, go to the DraftKings app and help to hammer the over. What's hammer the over? You ask. There's a there's a promo on DraftKings right now with the Bills and the Patriots. The more people that make a bet, the under goes down. The unders at something like 26 points right now, 26 points. Keep And, and for every 5,000 you know, people across the DraftKings platform, you're going to lower that line a little bit more. The obvious one here is that when it gets close to game time, you're going to take the over uh, for uh, Buffalo and New, New England. And there you go. Hopefully we don't have a snowstorm in Buffalo and it doesn't turn out to be you know a 2 nothing final unless enough folks hammer the over to where that over is like a half point at the end. And then you're obviously going to take that over because you helped to hammer that over on the DraftKings yeah. Sportsbook app. One thing that's also very cool about uh, the AZ Wildcats podcast, again, go to uh, go PHNX, go into the locker. If you get a membership, you get a free back the A t-shirt. These things are going like hotcakes. So you better hop on. You better make sure ha- that happens. They got other cool stuff on there as well. But again, the Go PHNX locker. William, before we sign off right here, I wanted to get your take really quickly on Arizona basically bringing in the best football recruiting class that uh, we've ever seen. And something that if you include the transfer portal is basically about a top 15 class in the nation. Wait, not the uh, Tinder portal as uh, Bill Walton yeah, called it as tonight? As Bill Walton called it. Have, William, have you ever seen anything like this? No. No. Stoops flirted with some top 20 classes. I think if we went back and reevaluated like the 95 class that ended up being the 98 team, we would find it would in reality be, you know, a bunch of four stars. My dog just took my microphone cord. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I, I would say this. 
My only caution, even with the transfers, only three of them were upperclassmen. Um, I just caution you that people are already like bowl game. Eight, now, they're going to be really right. young. Because I think you're going to see a, they, they need like 10 guys to still transfer. And most of those are going to be upperclassmen, I think. So be cautious. Be optimistic. Next year, you want building blocks. You want to see them, you know, win a handful of games, be competitive. This team is being built for two and three years from now. But again, yeah, you know, getting getting Delara, getting the the that defensive lineman is all potential out of UCLA. Um, you know, now we're hearing that was it Savanea might be like the strongest person ever to set foot in the state of Arizona in like the last twenty years. Right. Um, we, you've got the three receivers. You know, two of them were six four. It's going to be fun. It just might take again more than. I don't know if they're going to flip the switch in September and instantly become a bowl team, but uh, assuming we get good player development, assuming we see a growth in the coaching staff um, and of the players on campus, th- there's a lot of talent. They're not going to be deep, but yeah, the potential is there. And when you know you've got uh, Mike's cousin Speedy, um, a lot of you, people you think- got my my soulmate in 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 Jonah Coleman, who's like my height, as is Noah Fafita. Uh, good things can happen. And I just want to I just want to clarify something here because everybody saw the Army All-American Bowl and people are saying Rayshon Speedy Luke. I'm getting the question asked all the time. To my knowledge, we are not related. So I just want to put that out there. We are probably about the same size, but I think he is genetically a little bit more blessed in uh um at running than I am. So again, Rayshon, Speedy Luke, Iron Mike Luke, not related to my knowledge. You just cannot tell me that you and Speedy are not related, just like I know Juju is John Juju Smith Schuster, who's back great, by the way. Great, great, great grandson. <laughs> All right, everybody out there, we're going to sign off again. Really appreciate uh, everybody on there. We got Shane Diefenbach, who uh, does a great job over at ASU, saying that he might start back in the A. Well, you know, you know where to get those T-shirts, Shane. You're up there. But uh, everybody that contributed, really appreciate it. Got some new people on here. Joey Martinez, Barrett Hartman. Um, you know, everybody keep it going. It's a real community feel right here. Not St. U of A. What was it again, Brad? Stu of A. Stu of A. I do apologize. Robbie, thanks for here. Scott, as always. Sean, We'll, uh, we're letting you off the hook this uh, we're letting you off the hook this game we will be back with you Saturday though getting you all ready and you know what William you've got an open invitation for that game as well it always comes down to my coaching obligations as I am guiding soccer and volleyball teams on weekends right. for John Schuster William Brad Alice I am merely Mike Luke you've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast <laughs>